Well, hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious studies revision video. I'm Ben Waddle and today we are looking at religious experiences. Now, please do excuse me, as you may be able to hear, I have lost my voice. Well, actually, no, I've finally got it back. This is the first day in about a week I can actually speak. So I thought, right, let's sit down and let's talk about religious experiences. So yes, please do excuse my voice. I'm on the LEMSIP. We're going to keep going. We're going to soldier on. It's what William James would want. Don't you agree? So at the bottom of the screen here, as you can see, we've got some of the key thinkers, some of the philosophers, the theologians and indeed the atheists who will be talking about today. And remember, with A-level religious studies, it is so important you know your scholars, that you refer to your scholars and you try and refer to their key quotes, their key ideas where you can in order to show the examiner you have got that expert knowledge of the subject and of course of the scholars whose ideas we're talking about. So we will continuously be referring to scholars in today's video and I really hope that inspires you to do the same in the essays that you write. Make sure you are name dropping those scholars, you're referring to their books, you're referring to their key quotes and the sound bites that we'll look at today in order to secure those top marks. So how are we going to get an A star in religious experiences? Well, if you are following the AQA route, this is where we are in terms of the philosophy of religion section. So we're looking in today's video at religious experiences. Now, if you're following other exam board routes, I think this video will still be really helpful for you. I did OCR, for example, when I did this A-level myself, and I know that there are so many overlaps in terms of the content and in terms of the evaluation points as well. So I hope this video will be helpful for you, whichever exam board you are studying with. In terms of what this video will cover then, it is going to cover these 10 things. So as you can see, it is all led by the scholars, so important with A-Level RE. We'll be looking at Augustine, we'll be looking at Rudolf Otto, Walter Stace, William James, the main man, very excited to talk about him. We'll be looking at some particular examples of the influence and impact of religious experiences. So William James is all about the fruits, not the roots of these experiences. So we'll be looking at the fruits of them. We'll look at St. Paul and how his religious experience experience led to him stopping persecuting Christians and becoming the biggest promoter of Christianity in history. You know, many theologians say he is the real founder of Christianity because he turned it into a religion in its own right. We'll look at St. Bernadette and her experiences at Lourdes, where millions of people now travel each year to see the spot where uh, the Virgin Mary supposedly appeared to her some 18 times. And we'll also look at Davy Falkus, who wrote a book called From Gangland to God, who was a gangster in Newcastle uh, with quite a reputation for being a gangster and he had a religious experience and now is a pastor and we'll be looking at again at the fruits of that experience for him. We'll be looking at Richard Swinburne as support for religious experiences, but then, of course, we'll be looking as part of our AO2 at the criticisms of them, in particular today from Freud, Russell, Stross, and also we'll be looking at the ideas from Schweitzer, who was looking at Paul's religious experience and asking, was it a religious experience or was it an epileptic fit? And then, of course, we'll be looking at rebuttals to those criticisms, and I'll conclude by talking you through some exam questions from the AQA exam board for this video. So let's get started, shall we? Make sure you've got a few, you know, a few post-it notes ready, get your highlighters on standby, get yourself a hot drink. Let's get started. So I want to start actually by quickly referring to William James. Now we'll go into much more detail later on, but I want to refer you to his quote here. This quote for me is the best way of understanding what a religious experience is. So I had this on my bedroom wall when I was studying A-level RE. And I think this quote is just a brilliant, brilliant quote for understanding what a religious experience actually is, which I think is very helpful when it comes to studying this topic. So he said, what is a religious experience? He said, they are states of insight into depths of truth unplumed by the discursive intellect. Don't you love his language? They are illuminations, he said. So they, you know, illuminate you. They are revelations. They're full of significance and importance. All inarticulate, though they remain. So you cannot actually put into words what happened. And as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority for after time. Now, we'll be looking at his pint criteria 
for verifying the authenticity of an experience in a moment. But just for now, I want you to just take in, I want you to soak up that definition he's given us, that they are illuminations, they're revelations, full of significance and importance, but they're inarticulate. Um, you know, they cannot be put into words. Now, another topic on the philosophy of religion paper is, of course, religious language. So a great synoptic link there, this idea that they are experiences that you cannot use language to describe, that God is beyond, God is transcendent, and so these experiences are transcendent. They are beyond what human language can explain. You can't say, I went to Tesco and bought some grapes, and then say, I had a religious experience and had a meeting with God. You know, you can't put them into words because they're not ordinary experiences. Um, but what you can see, and this is important because he's a pragmatist, which means you evaluate theories or beliefs in terms of their practical application. He said, OK, you can't necessarily understand the experience, but you can absolutely see its fruits. So you can absolutely see the results of it in the life of St. Paul, for example, St. Bernadette or Davy Falcus. So just to start us off, I wanted to introduce you to William James and his definition there on religious experiences. But yes, more on him to come. For now, I want to quickly talk you through these key terms, um, which I think will really help with your study of religious experience. Please don't fall asleep before I've got to the end of the table. Um, supernatural, they are obviously supernatural events. They refer to what is beyond the normal forces of nature. They're not everyday experiences, as I say, like going to Tesco. They're numinous. This is a great word that we'll talk about in terms of Rudolf Otto. They relate to the power or presence of a deity, of God. Uh, an imaginative vision, then, this is one of Augustine's three types of religious experience. Um, it is a vision seen in the mind, usually through a dream. Um, a corporeal vision is a vision that comes through the physical senses relating to the physical body. And then an intellectual vision, as the word suggests, is a vision without any visual image. It's where the experience is an illumination of the soul. Our key example we'll mention is St. Teresa of Avila. But don't worry, we're going to break that down and talk about Augustine in just a moment. Uh, transcendent, then, one of my favourite words. It is the concept that God is above and beyond the space-time universe. He is wholly other. Passivity, then, is uh, one of William James's criteria, actually, for assessing a religious experience. It is the idea that the experiencer does not control the experience, but is controlled by it. They are passive in the experience. They don't go, let's have a drink, let's do some drugs. Oh, here's God. They are passive in the experience. It happens to them. They don't induce it themselves. Um, ineffability is the idea that you cannot describe it. It is ineffable. It is inarticulate, as James said. Um, it has to be directly experienced. It has to be experienced in order to be understood. Noetic quality. It's the idea that the experience will give rise to knowledge. So a religious experience, James says, will give you knowledge. It will give you insight into depths of truth unplumed, as he said. Uh, you will learn something from it and that knowledge will change your life. It is that state of insight. Transiency is the idea that the experience is temporary. It is usually under two hours long, but, and this is important, the effects are long lasting. So although the experience is very short, the effects of it are long lasting. Introvertive is the next key term. It is a religious experience in which the sense experience is totally suppressed. So Walter Stay says this is the ultimate kind of religious experience because there is no sense of I, you're completely overwhelmed by it. Whereas an extrovertive experience is one where the sense experience is still active. And so this is seen by Stace as the halfway to the introvertive full package, if you like. Neurotheology, then, another word I love, is the attempt to explain religious experience and behaviour in neuroscientific terms. So, for example, did St. Paul have a religious experience or did he have an epileptic fit? If we had modern medicine back when he was on the road to Damascus, would we be calling an ambulance for him rather than letting him carry on to Damascus to start his conversion to Christianity? And then finally, temporal lobe epilepsy. And this is again linked to St. Paul. So people with this are sometimes prone to having religious visions and mystical experiences. So you could argue that this shows scientifically why religious experiences are not uh, evidence for God because they have an alternative explanation. But actually, you could also say, hang on, does this not just show that God works through um 
epilepsy, for example. So is this actually a way that God works or is it proof that God doesn't exist because it's a very obvious alternative explanation for these experiences? Plenty to talk about today. Cannot wait to get started. So let's do that. And we're going to start with St. Augustine. He gives us the three types of vision. And this is really important, you know, in terms of categorizing different types of vision. There is not one size fits all. There are three different ones to have a look at. So the first one is the corporeal. And this is a vision through physical sight. This refers to supernatural experiences mediated through the physical senses. OK, so the visionary will see the figure or the object in the same way as they would see a chair. So corporeal, all you need to know is that it's where you're seeing real things. Yeah. So in the same way that I'm seeing that cup right now, I would be having that experience. Our example is the 18 visions of Mary that Bernadette of Lourdes says she experienced. She believed as a 14 year old girl that she was physically seeing the Virgin Mary in front of her. So it actually happened in real life. The imaginative, in contrast, is a vision seen in the mind. So whereas um, Bernadette believes she saw Mary in front of her physically, the imaginative is where it's seen in the mind or in what we call the mind's eye. This is often as a dream. So our example is Joseph's dream in the New Testament, in which he was told Mary was pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit, and so he should marry her. Another dream he had is when he had a dream telling him to, after Jesus had been born, to flee Bethlehem because Herod had begun his massacre of the infants. So it's where you don't see it in physical sight, you see it in the mind's eye. So it's not with your actual eye, it's with the mind's eye. And as I say, this often takes the form of a dream. And the final type that he gives us is the intellectual. This is probably the most difficult to understand. It is where there's no visual image. The experience illuminates the soul. So it's not physically, it's not in the mind, it's in the soul. Uh, an example of this is mystic visions. They are hard to understand as they defy description, but they do enlighten the soul. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila was a mystic who had this kind of vision. And she said, I saw nothing with the eyes of the body, nothing with the eyes of the soul. So as I say, there is no image. So it is an illumination rather than something that you actually see, albeit or not albeit, but whether that's physically or in the mind either. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? The corporeal, the imaginative and the intellectual as your three categories there. I want to talk to you now about the idea of the holy from someone called Rudolf Otto, who wrote a book of the same name. Now, he is the man that gives us the idea of numinous experiences, which is what we believe religious experiences to be. And as I say, he wrote this book on the nature of religious experience. He said the word holy means other than or separate from. So as we said, the idea is religious experiences are a taste of transcendence. They are a taste of the holy other. They are an experience with the holy which is outside of our normal experience and so it is an attempt to describe the sense some people have of a reality totally outside and beyond their experience of themselves and the world and this is what he believes religious experiences to be they are the numinous they are an experience of the holy other that takes you outside of your normal sense experience outside of your normal everyday experience as i say they are transcendent they are inarticulate and they are completely overwhelming and life changing now um otto gives an example from the old testament he gives an example from isaiah chapter 6 as an example of a numinous experience so i thought we could have a quick read of that together so in Isaiah chapter 6 we read in the year that king Uzai died I hope I've said that right I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were the seraphim each with six wings with two wings they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory at the sound of their voices the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke woe to me i cried i am ruined for i am a man of unclean lips and i live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty so an emphasis here on this sight so it's obviously not an intellectual vision on this sight of god 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken from with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. So Otto is saying this is a numinous experience. It is an experience of the holy other. What Isaiah is experiencing there is not, as I say, like going to Sainsbury's to get your groceries. It is something that is completely holy other, unrelated to spatio-temporal experience. And he says, and this is important, it is an experience that is the basis of all genuine religion. So to have genuine religion, you've got to have this kind of experience. These numinous experiences are the foundation for genuine religion. And we're going to talk about the fruits of these experiences in just a moment. He says it is a non-rational. So it's not rational thinking about Plato and, you know, all those ideas of Descartes and the mind and rational thought. It is not rational. And it is a unique form of experience, totally outside of our everyday reality. The emphasis is on God's transcendence, on the fact that God is so much greater than us, that God is something completely beyond human comprehension and understanding. It refers to a presence and reality that cannot be understood with the senses or the intellect. And it is ultimately a sense of the holy. So the numinous, it means having a strong religious or spiritual quality, indicating or suggesting the presence of the divine. So what's important to note here, guys, is that a religious experience has got to have, and I know it sounds obvious, but it's important, a strong religious or spiritual quality, yeah? So me going to Tesco and finding they've got my favourite flavour of crisps in stock in the meal deal is not a religious experience. It's a great experience. It's made my day. I've got my prawn cocktail. I can have that with my sandwich and my drink. Brilliant. But it's not a religious experience because it's not got that strong religious or spiritual quality. There is no presence of the divine in the prawn cocktail crisps. Yeah. For it to be a religious experience, to be a numinous experience, it's got to be something wholly other. And that is going to be non-rational. It's going to be totally outside of my everyday experience because I don't have an encounter with God every other day, believe it or not. Um, and it, it's going to give me this overwhelming sense of the that divine being present basically it's a sense of the holy so that is what a numinous experience is an experience of the holy other a strong religious or spiritual quality and one way that otto describes this or one way that we can remember this as well is this phrase here now this phrase is one you need to get written down so pause the video get a post-it note write this phrase down this phrase encapsulates what Otto believes a religious experience to be. He says it's going to be mysterium, tremendum et fascinant. Awful pronunciation. I think I was going a bit French there, but it's a brilliant quote. Please make sure you remember this. Commit this quote to memory. This is a quote from Otto from his book, The Idea of the Holy. And this is how he characterizes a genuine religious experience, which, remember, he believes is the foundation for genuine religious belief. It is mysterium tremendum et fascinant. So, <coughs> do you excuse me? <clears throat> this is what an authentic religious experience will be. First of all, it will be mysterious. It will be far removed from humanity. Remember, he said it's going to be wholly other um, so that it can be experienced, but not fully understood. It will elicit in you a response of awe and wonder. So you're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to feel a sense of wow, you know, to quote, what's the name? Kylie Minogue. You're going to feel quite shaken by it all because it's mysterious. It's not something you can understand because it's not something that you've been brought up with you know we we understand things that we're familiar with don't we this is not something we're going to be familiar with so it is going to be mysterious the next key word is trembling it is gonna evoke an emotional reaction within us because we're so overwhelmed so it's a fearsome experience of god's overwhelming majesty and energy there's going to be a sense of human nothingness you're going to feel very small as a result of this because you're going to realize how tiny you are and also it may lead to sinfulness. You're going to feel regret for the bad things that you've done, for example, because you're in the presence of the omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient, 
God, you know, so it's going to have that impact on you. You're going to feel very small and very regretful about your sins. And then as a result, you're going to feel this sense of absolute dependence on God. So the experience is going to make you realize how dependent you are on God, how small you are, how insignificant you are, <clears throat> to put it brutally. And that's going to evoke in you that feeling of God is everything. I absolutely depend on God. And then finally, fascinating. The experience is not only going to be mysterious, it's not only going to evoke trembling, but it's going to be fascinating. It's going to fascinate you. It's going to be compulsive. You can't look away. It's going to have this attractive nature. You're going to be drawn into it like a bee to honey because it's going to create this desire for a relationship with God. You're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to be scared, but you're going to be compelled into a closer relationship with God. So it's going to strengthen your religious faith. It's going to also, importantly, create an awareness of your need for salvation and forgiveness. Linking in with that idea, it exposes you to your sin. And so as a result, again, it's going to strengthen your faith. You're going to put greater dependence on God. I've thrown my pen. I'm that excited. <laughs> um, you're going to be even more dependent on God because you're going to realize how powerful he is in comparison to your insignificance. And it's going to create an awareness of the need for salvation and forgiveness. Better get a new pen because I've got very excited there. So Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinan, your free things for understanding Otto's outlook on religious experiences. They're mysterious, they evoke trembling, and they are fascinating. And ultimately, the result is they strengthen your faith, they highlight your insignificance, and they leave you with this even deeper commitment to God. Okay, just one more little fact, if you like, about religious experiences, and it comes from Walter State, and he wrote a book called Mysticism and Philosophy. Now, he believes that there are two types of religious experience. He was a British philosopher, best known for his writing on mysticism, and he is known as one of the pioneers in the study of mysticism. Um, and he came up, as I say, with these two types of religious experience. One of them is the full package, if you like, the introvertive experience. This is the ultimate mystical experience. And then there is the extrovertive, which he said some people have, where their senses are still active. But as I say, it's not the full package. It's not a 100% experience. It's just halfway there. So... <clears throat> He said, there is the introvertive experience, and this is the ultimate religious experience, the ultimate mystical experience. In this, there is no sense of I. So you know how um, Otto said you're completely overwhelmed, you feel really insignificant. It's very similar to that. Your sense of self is diminished in the experience. It is suppressed. There is no awareness of the world, and there is no intellectual function. So in other words, time stops and your mind stops. You're not then thinking when you're having the experience, what shall I have for tea? Is Emma Dale on yet? You know, you're completely immersed in the experience. Your sense of self has been lost. And so it's ineffable. You can't then put it into words. If someone says, how was your day? You can't then go, oh yeah, well, I had a religious experience. And what happened was X, Y, Z. You're not going to be able to do that because time has stopped. Your mind has stopped. You've been completely overwhelmed by the experience. It's a sense of the holy. So again, very much consistent with Otto. It's a sense of absolute peace. So it's going to overwhelm you with this feeling of complete peace and serenity. And also it's a sense of paradox. And paradox is, you know, when um, what is the paradox? It's like when something doesn't make sense. So, you know, you're not going to quite be able to believe it because it's something you've never experienced before. You're not expected to fully understand it. And he also says then there is the extrovertive, which, as I say, is the halfway point to a full experience. So with an extrovertive experience, sense experience is still active. Normal objects are seen with the physical senses. So you're not completely overwhelmed in the same way. Normal objects will be seen in, um, you know, physical sight using your eyes, but they are transfigured so that non-sensuous unity of all things shines through them. So you're still using your senses. You're going to gain some kind of knowledge. You're going to have some kind of experience from the senses. But remember, it's not a full experience. A full religious experience is where you lose use of your senses, you lose use of your mind, you forget time. So you're no longer in the world thinking, you know, where's my shopping list? Where's my phone gone? 
with that a Snapchat notification. You've been completely overwhelmed with the introverted, whereas the extroverted, it's kind of like a religious experience with the senses still going, with them still rolling, if you like. So those are the two classifications that he makes. Now, I want to talk to you about William James, the main man. So as I say, we've mentioned his quote and this key quote that I really want you to get on your wall, that they are states of insight into depths of truth unplumed by the discursive intellect. Their illuminations, revelations full of significance and importance, all inarticulate though they remain. And as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority for after time. Now we're gonna break this down by looking at his pint criteria. But before we do that, I want to make a note, or I'd like you to make a note, that William James is a pragmatist. So he was an American philosopher, historian, and psychologist, busy man. He is known as the father of American psychology. So, you know, kind of like an American Freud, if you like. And he's known as a pragmatist. He's more concerned with practical considerations than ideals. So pragmatist believes you should evaluate theories or beliefs in terms of their practical application. And basically the way we're going to remember this is that he's more interested in the fruits rather than the roots. So he's not too interested in the origins of the experience and getting caught up in the theory of what produced this experience. He is more concerned practically with the outcomes because that is what we can observe. We cannot be sure what the experience was caused by. But what we can be sure about is the result of it, the fruits of it, um, because we can see that. And so as a pragmatist, as someone who looks at the practical application, he is very interested not in what caused that experience, but what the outcome is, what we can observe, what impact it had. And we're gonna focus on that for the next part of the video. So he gives, and this is very important, he gives the criteria for assessing the genuine nature of a religious experience. So he's not, as I say, interested in whether religious experiences prove the existence of God. That is not a question he is interested in. He's interested in how we establish what an authentic religious experience is or what a genuine religious experience is. How do we know that the experience you've had can be classified as a religious experience? And then he's very interested in um, the, the impact that it has. He's interested in the fruits of it rather than the roots of it. So <clears throat> in terms of assessing the criteria, no, in terms of the criteria for assessing the genuine nature of a religious experience, there we go, the lens has gone straight to my head. And um, he gives us these four points. So it's called the pint formula. Nice little way of remembering it. And basically this tells us, right, someone said they've had a religious experience. Get out your pint criteria. Let's see, does it meet this criteria? Is it passive? Is it ineffable? Has it contained noetic quality? And was there transience? So this is our criteria for assessing the genuine nature of religious experience. Please note, it is not about assessing does this religious experience prove God exists? It is simply about assessing, was it a genuine religious experience? So P is for passive. You are passive in the experience. For it to be a genuine religious experience, you cannot induce or direct what happens. You are not in control. It happens to you. That's really important that you are passive as opposed to being active. You can't, as they say, start popping the pills and taking the drinks and then, you know, be like, oh, I'm floating. You know, it's got to happen to you. The second one is ineffability. It cannot be articulated in words. You may only be able to say what it was not. So very much like synoptic link to language games, not language games, to religious language in general, and the via negativa, yeah? We're saying you cannot say what God is. You can only say what God is not. Similarly, we're saying here, it is ineffable. You can't then say, and then this happened, and then I went here, and then God said this, and Jesus put this on. No, it's ineffable. Because it's not everyday experience, you can't use everyday language to describe it. It is so wholly other, to use Otto's phrase, that it cannot be articulated in words. You can only say what it was not. Noetic quality then, it contains deep insight into truths. Truths unplumed, as he says. So you're going to be given this deep spiritual knowledge that you could not have gained from any other worldly source. 
So it's going to give you this real depth of truth, this, as I say, spiritual truth, religious truth that could not have been gained through any other method. Um, and so that is non-rational and intuitive knowledge. So it's not going to be worldly knowledge. It's this really extraordinary spiritual religious knowledge. And then finally, transience. This is the idea. The experience is short. So the experience only takes place over maybe one or two hours. However, it has a lifelong impact. So it's a short amount of time. We can say it happened in this time period, but then it has lifelong effects. So a very short time for the experience, a very long time for the impact. And this leads me on to this important point that you should judge the experience by its fruits, not its roots. So our key question should be, what impact does it have on the individual? And that leads me on to the next section of the video where we're looking at the influence and impact of religious experiences. So as I say, we've established, is this a genuine experience? Were they passive? Is it ineffable? Did it have noetic quality? Was it transient? And on that point, on the transient point, we have to look about the authority it has for after time, as Jane says. We have to look at those fruits as opposed to worrying too much about the roots. Now, we will talk about the roots later because, you know, people um, like Freud, for example, would be very interested in the roots. They would say, well, actually, no, where has this experience come from? Um, Bertrand Russell, again, interested in the, the roots. He says, no, religious experiences are people drinking too much or eating too little. But for James, he's interested in the roots. So on that note, we're going to look at three case study examples. And the first one is St. Paul, I think the most significant, important one. So the book of Acts in the New Testament tells the story of Saul. Remember, he was called Saul before his conversion. Again, showing you the impact of the experience that he changed his name. As a result of it, he changed his entire life and he became the biggest evangelist in Christian history. I do not believe Christianity would exist today, certainly not on the scale it exists today, without Paul. So... The book of Acts tells the story of Saul traveling to Damascus, where he was intending to persecute Christians. So I'm sure you may know the story, but he was traveling there as a hater of Christianity in order to kill Christians. That was his mission. He wanted to wipe them out. He wanted them all dead. He wanted Christianity to be extinguished from the face of the earth. Now, as he traveled towards Damascus, he had his religious experience. We are told that he was blinded by a bright light from heaven and he fell to the ground. He then heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When Saul asked who was speaking, he received the reply. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. He was blinded for three days. So the experience happened to him, remember, until a man who'd... Um, been spoken to by God, a religious man in Damascus, who Paul was probably going to kill by the time he got there. Um, so when Anaisis, who God had, as I say, spoken to in a vision, placed his hands on him to restore his sight. And then he was able to see again. As a result of this experience, we are told by the Bible, Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So he went from, as I say, trying to kill all the Christians to being the person who was promoting this message that Jesus was the Messiah and he was the son of God. As I say, as a result, he transformed his entire life. He became, as I say, the most famous evangelist in history. He went from persecuting Christians to promoting Christianity. He is known today as the founder of Christianity as a religion. Remember, Jesus and his early followers who Paul never met, by the way, were all Jewish. It was very much a radical Jewish sect. It was Paul who would then found Christianity as this independent religion. And so Paul wrote 13 letters, at least, promoting Christianity, which make up almost half of the books in the New Testament today. So half of the New Testament is Paul's writing. That is how significant he is on Christianity to this day, because, of course, those books are read by billions of Christians around the world to this day. And so they continue to influence Christians. They continue to influence Christian theology and thinking. Billions of people, as they say, continue to read them today. So if you want to talk about the authority of the experience for after time, we can say 2000 years later, 
billions of people are still being influenced by Paul's writing. And bearing in mind, if Paul, sorry, if Saul had had his pre-experienced way, there would be no Christianity. He would have wiped it out. He would have killed them all. But because of that experience, he became the biggest evangelist. They were the biggest promoter of Christianity and the biggest influence on Christian theology to this day. That is the impact of that experience. It is truly, truly extraordinary. As I say, he not only stopped killing Christians, but he became the biggest preacher on Christianity. And you could say he continues to be because people continue to be converted to Christianity because of reading his letters. And also children being brought up in the religion are read his letters. They read his letters as part of their faith journey when they go to church with their parents. So, you know, you, you cannot, can you, underestimate the influence and the impact of that experience. Now, we will be asking what actually caused it. Was it an epileptic fit? Um, you know, and we'll be looking at alternative explanations to what is given in the Bible, which, of course, was written thousands of years before we had insight into things like epilepsy and into, you know, the workings of the mind and neuroscience. But of course, for James, we're interested pragmatically in the fruits, not the roots. And look at the fruits. That's all I'm going to say. So our next one is St. Bernadette of Lourdes, a much more contemporary example. Very interesting one as well, because she was only 14 when it happened. Does that make us more likely to believe her or less likely to believe her? I don't know. Interesting question to consider. But what I do know for sure, <coughs> do excuse me, is that Bernadette had the first in a series of visions of the Virgin Mary, aged 14. She had 18 visions in total in 1858, between February and July, um, near to the Massia Bale Grotto. I'm not going to try and say that again. <laughs> I'm just going to say Grotto from now on. Now, Mary revealed herself, so she actually told Bernadette who she was, with the words, I am the Immaculate Conception, which is, of course, the key Christian doctrine about um, Mary and the Immaculate Conception, the birth of Jesus, Jesus born to a virgin, the Virgin Mary. Now, during one vision, on the 25th of February, to be exact, Mary told Bernadette to drink water of a spring, as there was no spring. Bernadette dug. Sorry, I really read that really strangely. <laughs> I do apologise. I meant to say Bernadette was told by Mary to drink water from a spring. Bernadette looked around. There was no spring. And so she thought, right, I better dig. Let's see what she's going on about. Let's get digging. When she started digging, lo and behold, water started to flow from where she had dug. And interestingly, this water still flows today. So this water is still flowing today. It's still going strong and it has a reputation for healing. So it's not just seen as any old water. It's not your Evian water. It's not your Volvic. It's seen as holy water, which has the power, power, which has the power to heal people. Now, during other visions, yeah, remember there were 18 in total, Mary told Bernadette that a chapel should be built on the site and that people should attend in processions, and indeed they do to this day. Now, interestingly, Bernadette um, was questioned and there was a lot of scepticism when she was making these claims at the time, but she defended them with real passion against that scepticism from her parents, the police, local authorities, even the clergy doubted her. And as a result of this, she as an individual, for thinking about the impact and influence, she as an individual became a nun. And interestingly, she never returned to Lourdes. She was so overwhelmed by that experience at such a young age, she never returned to the site of those um, appearances, of those visions. So she died. Interestingly, she was very unwell. She died aged 35 and she was later canonised. So she is now a saint. However, even though she didn't return, five million people do visit every single year, many of them seeking healing. Uh, over 200 million people in total have visited since Bernadette experienced the visions. She dug and the water appeared and the chapel was built. So millions and millions of people. So that is the impact of that experience that a place of pilgrimage has been created in France. Interestingly, 70 miraculous healings have been recognised at Lourdes. There is a really tough, actually, um, verification process. You know, they really want to check whether it is an authentic healing um, since 1858. So 70 
to be fair, that is quite a small number, though, isn't it? If you think 200 million people have gone, there have only been 70 miraculous healings. You know, is that actually a high number? Although many more have been attributed to the intercession of Mary at the shrine. So many more people have said they have been healed, but only 70 have been properly verified by the church. <clears throat> but the point is, of course, it totally changed her life. She ded dedicated her life to God in a monastery, but it's then also changed Christianity because it's created this major place of pilgrimage where millions of people travel every single year in search of healing in order to strengthen their faith. So again, the influence and impact of those visions. Finally then, whilst I can still speak, we're going to talk about Davy Falkus, who is a contemporary example. He is alive, he is kicking, and he is spreading the word of God today. And he is the author of From Gangland to God. So let me tell you a little bit about Davy Falkus. So his mother died when he was a baby, and five years later, uh, his adoptive mother died as well. By the age of seven, by his own admission, he was dro droking. I can't speak today. I do apologise. Well, actually, no, we've already realised that, haven't we? By the age of seven, he was smoking, drinking and stealing. By the age of 18, he had been jailed twice. Once for an armed siege. Excuse me, that's not funny. That's shocking. And once for dealing heroin. So again, before the age of 18. Um, at age 21, he started a job, but not any old job. He started working for the Geordie Mafia in Newcastle. He had been shot and stabbed. He said, violence was a way of life. It was my norm. I blew fortunes on drink and drugs. But by the age of 29, he was desperately unhappy. And so he tried Buddhism. He tried Hinduism. Um, and, he, you know, he tried to find peace within those religions. He couldn't. And he ended up experiencing suicidal thoughts. He just could not find peace. But then in 1995, he picked up a Bible that um, a friend had left in his house. And he, he opened the Bible. And in, in that moment, as he was reading the page that was open, he actually shouted out to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, if you are really there and if you are really God, as this Bible says, and if you come and help me now, I'm all yours. I'll, I'll convert. I'll be a Christian. And Falco says that in that moment, the room grew brighter. And he says he saw Jesus stood before him. And he says that Jesus said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Now, our important focus, of course, is on the influence and impact. And so on that note, he said that as a result, his desire for drugs and alcohol, which he'd abused for over 20 years, remember, since the age of seven, he says it lifted. It went. As a result of the experience, he was no longer a drug and alcohol um, misuser. He said, I felt born again. It was the most beautiful and terrifying experience of my life. Now, that obviously makes me think of Otto's line, Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinating. Yeah, it was terrifying. That seems consistent, doesn't it, with what Otto said these experiences are. And here's the important bit when we're talking about the influence and impact of religious experiences. He said everything changed. As a result of this experience, everything changed. He says, I'd made my living from crime, as we know, in the Geordie Mafia. I was used to having everything I wanted at my fingertips. I walked away from it all. Even though I had nothing, I'd never felt so happy. So if you're looking at the fruits of that experience, it has totally changed his life. Indeed, he is now a minister, a husband and a father, an author of his book, and he's travelled the world sharing his story. So I think that one in particular, perhaps because it's a very modern case study, isn't it? And it, you know, it uses things that we're quite familiar with in the modern world. I think that one in particular demonstrates the influence and impact of these experiences. We could sit here all day, um, and indeed some people do, we could sit here all day and go, well, what actually caused that bright light? You know, did someone just switch the street lights on, you know? Did the sun come out from behind the clouds by coincidence? You know, what actually led to the room growing brighter and Jesus standing there? You know, what drugs had he been dealing? You know, we could spend hours doing that, you know. But for James, of course, we can never know that. And he's more interested in the practical nature. He's more interested in saying what actually happened. What were the results? What were the fruits of this experience? And they are very clear to us, aren't they? We can see exactly what happened for David Falkus as a result of this experience. 
So this does lead me to the key question now. Are religious experiences proof that God exists? Because it's one thing to say it's changed someone's life. It's led them to religion. But it's another thing to say that it's proof God exists. And this is going to be our key question as we look at the AO2. So are religious experiences proof that God exists? Or could they have an alternative explanation? Is there another reason? Is it an epileptic fit? Is it drink and drug misuse? What do you think about this question? It's going to be our key question. And we're going to start with someone who actually believes, yes, it can support the existence of God. And that is Richard Swinburne, someone we have already met on the course. Now, he proposes these two principles when it comes to um, someone's claims to have had a religious experience. They are the principles of credulity and testimony. So Swinburne says, Number one, the principle of credulity. We should always assume that things are credible unless we have evidence that proves otherwise. So it's a little bit like the idea that you are innocent until proven guilty. So he says we ought to believe that things are as they seem to be unless we have significant evidence that we are actually mistaken. And then we have his principle of testimony. Now, these are very similar concepts. I've got to be honest with you. Um, but just notice the slight difference. So principle of credulity is sort of about things in general. So things being what they seem to be. Whereas the principle of testimony is more focused on the testimony, as the name suggests, of the individual. The principle of testimony is the idea that we should assume people are telling the truth unless we have evidence that proves otherwise. So again, this idea, innocent until proven guilty. So he says, in the absence of special considerations, and we'll talk about what they are in a minute, the experiences of others are probably as they report them. Now, you might think, well, he's a bit naive, isn't he? Believe in everything people tell him. But this is his approach. Uh, these are his principles to what people tell us about what they have experienced. He says, if something appears to be a religious experience, we should assume it is unless we have evidence that proves otherwise. And if someone says that they had a religious experience, we should assume they are telling the truth. Again, unless we have evidence that suggests otherwise. So his assumption, his default, if you like, is always to say, yeah, let's accept their belief. Not their belief. Let's believe what they say. Let's accept what they say. This is the principle of testimony and the principle of credulity. Now, he is, as I say, a big supporter of religious experiences. So I want to just quickly share with you some quotes that sort of underpin the two principles. So these are two principles that you need to know for the exam. And these are then a selection of quotes that underpin the reasons he believes in these two principles. The first one is this. He said, on our total evidence, theism is more probable than not. So he said, if you take all the evidence that we have about God, you get all of the facts and, you know, all the different arguments people have made, everybody from Augustine to Richard Dawkins. If you look at all the evidence we have, he says, actually, theism is more probable than not. Now, he's not saying that there is 100% certainty God exists, but he is saying it is more likely than not that God exists based on all the evidence available. So that is why he's inclined to believe these experiences, because he believes that overall, on our total evidence, theism is more probable than not. I would love to know what you think about that. I think that is a fascinating statement for him to have made. Um, and I'd love to know what his total evidence is. <laughs> but that's his bold claim. Theism is more probable than not. And that is why it's probable that when someone says they've had a religious experience, yeah, OK, let's accept them. Let's take their word for it. Because, again, of this idea of probability, he also says we ought to believe that things that no, I'll start that again. We ought to believe that things are as they seem to be until we have evidence that we are mistaken. So, again, is he being naive or is he right that actually things are usually as they seem, that people do usually tell the truth? Is that your experience in life, that people usually tell the truth, that things are usually what they seem? Obviously, Plato, for example, would say absolutely not. Don't trust your senses. Always be sceptical. Descartes would agree. He said we can doubt absolutely everything except the fact that we exist. Yeah. So many philosophers, many very distinguished philosophers disagree with him. But that's his belief. Um, I've put here a couple of what I've called comparative concepts. 
So, for example, Occam's razor is, of course, as we know, the idea that the simplest explanation is always the best. So if something appears to be something, then it probably is. Let's not overcomplicate it by adding on extra bits and going, well, it could be this or it could be this. Occam's razor is that the simplest explanation is the best. So you could say if it looks like a mug, it is a mug. Yeah, that's my simplest explanation. I'm not going to go, but is it a hologram? Could it be a plant pot in disguise? Do you know what I mean? So that's the idea of Occam's razor that could be compared to this. And also a really relevant societal example is um, the idea of innocent until proven guilty, which, of course, is in our legal system in the UK. We have a legal system that works on the assumption that people are innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, it is the prosecutor's job to present that case, to argue the case that you've done it, you've committed the crime. You don't walk into the courtroom and they go, guilty, done. You know, we are all presumed innocent until proven guilty. Very similar to this. We ought to believe that things are as they seem to be until we have evidence that we are mistaken, that there should be this default assumption of innocence or of truth until we have a reason to question. Next one then. He said, if you say never trust appearances until it is proved that they are reliable, you will never have any beliefs at all. So he's, you know, he's saying here about those people that say, well, you know, you can't believe in religious experiences. You know, you've got to question it. He's saying, well, if you go through life like that, never trusting appearances, you're not going to ever have any beliefs. You're never going to believe anything. You're going to be too busy questioning everything like Descartes to actually live your life. So he's saying we need to have a point where we say we need to be pragmatic to use that term we need to be practical you know if you say never trust appearances until you've got absolute proof you will never have any beliefs at all which is why he's saying theism is more probable than not you are never going to have absolute proof about anything you've got to have working principles you've got to have working beliefs and truths and assumptions that you can rely upon and you can use so you can't expect absolute proof you've got to you know, just work with appearances. So if it appears to be a religious experience and it appears to have had a good result, just go with it. And then another one, just as you must trust your five ordinary senses, so it is equally rational to trust your religious sense. So this is a great quote. I love this quote. He's saying we don't just have the five empirical senses. We have this extra sense the religious sense, this really reminds me of Calvin's sensus divinitatis, the idea there is a sense of the divine, a seed of the divine within each of us. So you could argue, do we all have a religious sense? And if that religious sense is telling you something that you've had this experience, for example, you should trust it. Now, of course, I've put that. What would Plato say about this? Because he said you must not trust your five senses. Absolutely not. Um, but it is an interesting argument that we have this religious sense that we should absolutely trust. And, you know, you don't whenever you see something, you don't go, is that really a mug? Is that is that really a cup for my drink? You just go, there's a cup. Get the kettle. Let's go. Yeah, I, I don't stand there checking whether it really is before I pour the water. I just need my lamb sip, as you can hear. Um, and in the same way, he's saying you should trust your religious sense. If you've had a sense of the divine, if you've had a sense of the holy other, you need to absolutely trust that. You need to absolutely go with that. Don't start questioning it. In the same way you just trust your senses, you should trust your religious sense. But of course, you could bring in Plato to say, actually, don't even trust your senses. So... What do we think of this? What do we think of Swinburne's argument, this principle of credulity, this principle of testimony, and this idea that actually, if it appears to be a religious experience, it probably is one. Well, what could the strengths be? We could say it's good because it's consistent with James's pragmatic belief that experiences should be judged by their fruits, not their roots. Transformation in lifestyle and outlook is a powerful and observable argument. So we can say it is consistent. You know, if it if it shows or if you can see someone has changed their lives, then yeah, go on. We're going to take their testimony because why would they have changed their entire life for something that wasn't 100 percent real to them? Swinburne does take into account special considerations, as I mentioned, that may influence the reliability of someone's testimony. For example, some people are proven liars, some are drug users, some we could say have been diagnosed with mental health problems. And some, of course, may have an ulterior motive. They want to sell a book, they want to sell a product, you know, whatever it is. 
Um, so he acknowledges that there are special considerations. He acknowledges this as part of his argument. So you could argue the fact that Swinburne acknowledges there may be special considerations and seeks to address these strengthens his case. It shows he's not buried his head in the sand, that he's willing to engage, he's willing to question, he's willing to think critically. We could say that his approach is consistent with how humans navigate through life in general. We would not be able to get through life if we demanded absolute proof before accepting people's testimony. As he says himself, and we've looked at this quote, if you say never trust appearances until it is proved that they are reliable, you will never have any beliefs at all. So as I said before, it is this idea absolutely that if someone says they've had this experience and you can see the change it's led to in their life, you should just accept that because the appearance is not you know, on balance, going to be wrong. If it, if it looks like a religious experience, it probably is one. And we could also say he makes an inductive argument that seeks to investigate the probability of God's existence. He is acknowledging that his method is not perfect. Remember, he said the existence of God is more probable than not. Theism is more probable than not. He's not saying absolutely God exists. He's saying on our total evidence, it is more than 50 percent likely. And so it's an inductive argument. And so you could say people are more likely to agree with him because he's not making outlandish claims such as I am 100 percent certain that this is how things are. OK, but obviously there are a lot of criticisms. Um, he is saying that normal sense experiences are reliable, therefore religious experiences are reliable. Remember, he said, if you believe in your five senses, you should believe in your sixth religious one that he appears to have invented himself. But of course, we can say this is a dubious claim. How can you move from being convinced of the reliability of the senses, your five senses, to the reliability of mystical and visionary claims about God. Yeah, he's making a great leap there, a great leap in logic um, from the five senses that are universally agreed by scientists to exist to this sixth one that he's just randomly added in. So there's no evidence for that final sense that he's talking about. We could say personal testimony is not sufficient as absolute proof. You know, we don't believe in that, you know, the Big Bang or gravity or any of these key scientific concepts because one person has said, I, I, I know it. Yeah, we've gone out and tested it. Not me personally, but scientists have done so. It is never based on the testimony of one person alone. As I've put here, even if every single person who had a religious experience wholeheartedly believed that it was an experience of God, that would not objectively prove God exists. Yeah. Even if everyone who's had one says, yes, I now believe in God, that doesn't actually prove that God exists. It proves the experience has had an impact on them and it's changed their worldview and it's strengthened their faith. But it does not objectively prove that God therefore exists. So personal testimony is not sufficient, we could say. I love this example. Please use this in an exam if you can. The French rationalist Denis Diderot said that even if the entire population of Paris were to assume that a man had been raised from the dead, I would not believe it. So even if the whole population of a city believes something, that doesn't mean I'm going to believe it as well. Yeah, you can talk about this in terms of a link to utilitarianism, the tyranny of the majority. Just because everybody thinks something is right, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Yeah. So, you know, we could talk about populism as well. If you want to talk about politics and, you know, just because everybody voted for something or everybody, you know, agreed with something. Not going to give any examples so I don't get in any political trouble. Um <laughs> That doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean it was still the right thing to do. So that's a really excellent point, I think. And finally, we have mentioned this. Plato said that we cannot trust our senses or empirical experience. Remember that famous quote from him? The body is an endless source of trouble for us. We cannot rely on any evidence that we gain from our senses because they deceive us. And so even if someone believes they are telling the truth, you know, we're not disputing that someone who's had a religious experience believes it was a religious experience, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are. They could be mistaken. The person themselves could be mistaken. And we're really going to unpack this in a second when we talk about Freud and we talk about Strauss and Russell and Schweitzer. This is illustrated by contemporary criticisms of religious experiences, which show that they are the result of hallucination, illness or substance 
um, or drug consumption. So as I say, we're going to really unpack that now when we look at the criticisms of religious experiences. I really do enjoy this topic. So make sure if you are following through with the, you've printed this slide, you're ready to write down those explanations on your table. I have filled in the key quotes for you. I think they're really helpful to know. Great sound bites to use in the exam. To excuse me, um, just to show you in the exam, as I say, show your examiner, I mean, that you know your, your key scholars and that you've read the key texts so that you know your key quotes. So your first criticism, it is from Sigmund Freud, the main man of 20th century psychology. He is the founder of uh, psychotherapy, uh, a founding father of modern psychology, and he believes that all human behavior could be explained by the subconscious mind. So these desires, these impulses that are shaped in childhood and um, that then influence us for the rest of our lives. And he believes that religion is an illusion. It's a great quote to use. You can use that, of course, on paper two when you're talking about secularism as well. So plenty of applications for this. And he said, the religions of mankind must be classed among the mass delusions of this kind. So religious belief is delusional. Very much an inspiration for Richard Dawkins and his book, The God Delusion. Again, the idea that belief in God is a delusion. So. Sigmund Freud, he argued that religion is a illusion. It is a neurosis. It's a childhood neurosis that emerges from our desire for a strong father figure in our lives. And so, excuse me, so we, um, we project onto God all the strong fatherly qualities that we want. And so God is a product essentially of our minds that we create. He said visions in particular are at best signs of immaturity so that we're acting like children and at worst symptoms of mental illness. So you're either acting like a young child or you are mentally unwell. Uh, he investigated, as I say, the role of the subconscious mind and he believed that religious belief is the result of infantile needs in particular for a powerful father figure. Religion is the projection of our greatest hopes, fears and desires. So in terms of your religious experience, I think that line that visions are at best signs of immaturity and at worst signs of mental illness, I think that's a brilliant criticism, isn't it? He's saying they are not from God, they are from your subconscious mind. And, you know, they could be a sign that you are mentally unwell. So obviously they are not evidence for the existence of God. And that's going to be the key thing you're linking it back to with your criticisms that they don't prove God exists. They prove that you need help. To put it a bit controversially, they prove that you are mentally unwell, Freud is saying. Bertrand Russell agrees. He said that religious experiences are hallucinations. He was a 20th century mathematician, logician and philosopher. We know him from the cosmological argument. He spoke about the fallacy of composition. He said there is no difference. I love this quote. Please write it on a post-it note. Look at this post-it note, by the way, guys. I mean, honestly, <laughs> this, is, this is where I would be writing it if I'm watching the video right now in a bold Font because it's a great criticism. He said, there is no difference between someone who eats too little and sees heaven and someone who drinks too much and sees snakes. Really interesting there. So he says that religious experiences have a physiological or a psychological explanation. They are caused by drinking too much or eating too little. Remember, James said they've got to be passive. They happen to you rather than being caused by you. Russell is saying they're always caused by you. They are, um, you know, the result of eating too little. They therefore do not prove the existence of God because they have a scientific explanation that they are delusions, that they can be cured by reducing your alcohol intake or eating enough. So, you know, they are mental illness again. Charles Strassen, who is a science fiction writer, he has a brilliant quote that I absolutely love. I think this is a really great quote to use in the exam. He said that one ape's hallucination, emphasizing the fact that we all evolved from apes and we are all ultimately animals. He said one ape's hallucination is another ape's religious experience. They are all matters of interpretation. If you've been brought up in a religious family, you are likely to believe you're having a religious experience. Whereas if you've been brought up in an atheist, household you are likely to believe that you're having a psychotic episode basically so he said apparent religious experiences are misinterpretations humans wrongly interpret 
physiologically originating experiences as divine. This is the result of social influences. So as I say, your upbringing, for example, someone from a Christian background may have a vision of Jesus. Someone from an Islamic background may have, again, you know, an Islamic inspired vision. Somebody from a Buddhist background may have a vision of the Buddha. Someone from a Sikh background, you get the you get the drift. The point is the cultural relativism of such experiences is the criticism of them. The fact that they are culturally relative, we are arguing, shows that they are simply a matter of misinterpretation, that they are all hallucinations, but it's just you are having them in different ways or seeing different things in your hallucination because of different things you've been taught about in your past, the way you've been brought up, the culture that you are immersed in. And finally, this is an interesting one because it is from a theologian. So it is from someone who believes in God. Interesting, isn't it? It's from Albert Schweitzer. And he believes that Paul had an epileptic fit. So, you know, on the road to Damascus, where he had that episode where he saw the bright light and he was struck down. Schweitzer says the most natural hypothesis for this is that Paul suffered, as you can hear, I cannot speak, <laughs> that Paul suffered from some kind of epileptiform attacks. It would agree with this, that on the road to Damascus, he hears voices during an attack, during an episode, and suffers afterwards from a temporary affection of the eyesight. If this experience at his conversion really happened during such an attack. So we could explain the voices, and then we could explain the blindness, because it's as a result of the um, epileptic attack. So he studied the particular case of Paul, as I've said, and he found that the most natural hypothesis, you could quote that in the exam, I think that's a nice line to use, is that Paul was suffering from an epileptiform attack. Indeed, as we've said, people with temporal lobe epilepsy are sometimes prone to religious visions and mystical experiences. Now, of course, this raises a massive question for us about the foundation of Christianity. Was Christianity founded upon an epileptic fit? That is the question that we're left asking. But of course, I have to bring in a rebuttal here and I have to bring in William James. Of course I do. He's our main man. And he said, does the origin matter? Does it matter if it was an epileptic fit? Or should the experience be judged by its fruits, not its roots? For example, what impact did Paul's experience have? It changed his life, you could argue, for the better, and it changed human history. Full stop. But of course, for our scientists, for our psychologists, for our, you know, neuroscientists, they do want to understand the origins in the brain. They do want to know about the roots. How can you just focus on the fruits? Surely you want to think, but what actually caused it? What actually was the origin? So that's interesting to consider. I also want you to consider these what we call challenges to religious experience alongside some defences. So some further criticisms could be we only have the word of the experience, the person that the experience took place. You know, you, you can't check it in any other way. You're basing it on what they've told you has happened to them. You could say they're mistaken or lying. I want you to think, how would a theist respond? Think about Swinburne, maybe. Only religious, only certain people, sorry, have experienced them. This suggests God shows favoritism. I think that's a really strong criticism. You know, if you want to, in your essay, say, I thought God was omnibenevolent. I thought he loved everybody. Why is he then showing favoritism? Their private nature means they cannot be objectively proved. They suggest that God has just picked certain people as his favourites. What could your response be? You could say, for example, well, God has chosen certain people to reveal things through. His message is still universal, but he's chosen the people who would be best at revealing that message. And whatever you say about Paul, he did a great job of sharing the message, didn't he? Because we're still reading his letters to this day. That could be my rebuttal. And then the experiences can be explained psychologically, medically or by neuroscience. Freud, for example, saying that they are the result of subconscious fears and desires or their symptoms of mental illness. Now, a response to that could be just because it can be explained psychologically or medically doesn't necessarily mean it's not from God. You could say that God and this is your uh, neurotheology coming in here. God actually works through the brain. So actually, all that the neuroscientists have done is demonstrate how God works. There's your rebuttal. 
what do you think of that one do let me know in the comments down below and also do let me know your own but yeah i've just tried to model for you there if you like some responses to those challenges so they are some strong criticisms I do like that favouritism one. And they are some rebuttals as well that you could use in your essay. So the very last thing I want to share with you today before I leave you in peace and I lose my voice entirely is these paper one style questions from AQA. Number one, examine the influence of religious experiences on the lives of religious believers. So, of course, that's all about the fruits, not the roots. And in that essay, I would be talking about um, Paul Bernadette. And of course, Davy Volkers talking about the impact the experience had in terms of changing and transforming their lives. And then a, a 15 mark style question. Science proves that religious experiences are not true. So again, that I'd want to be using Freud. I'd want to use neurotheology. Um, I'd want to use Schweitzer, um, Stroth and Russell. And I'd be saying, you know, this is why, you know, it could show they're not true, that they're not ex um, evidence for God's existence. But then, of course, you want to give your responses, such as James saying it's about fruits, not roots. Uh, you could talk about, if you want to make a synoptic link, Wittgenstein, maybe, and talk about language games and say, you know, science and religion do completely different things. Talk about Swinburne and having a religious sense. Talk about credulity and testimony. If the person says it's happened, don't worry what your scientists are saying you should usually believe and accept what they've got to say for themselves. I do hope that's been helpful, guys. I do hope you've been able to hear me. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and good luck with your studies. Take care. Bye-bye.